Hello there, I'm K-Ball and welcome to Human Skills, where I interview tech industry leaders about all the non-technical skills that go into success in the tech industry. Paulo André has worked as an engineer, manager, director, and VP of engineering before becoming a leadership coach working with technical leaders. He has experience working with small teams and building scalable organizations, and he's an incredibly clear communicator and thinker. This was one of those interviews where I wanted to clip almost every section. We talked about values, the leader-leader model, organic metaphors for organizations, and more. I highly recommend listening to the entire interview. But the biggest theme in our conversation was around feedback and complex systems. How to set up feedback loops at different scales of an organization. Why feedback is necessary to improve a complex system. And why every team is complex and how we can deal with that. Please enjoy this conversation with Paolo Andre. Paolo, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. Um, well, let's start. Maybe do you want to share a little bit about yourself, your background, and how you came to care about these things I'm calling human skills? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked the question because, well, it feels like two or three lives in one at this point. Honestly, the last couple of decades, I'm an engineer by trade. That's my, you know, my background. I've done it for many years ultimately had the opportunity to start leading teams and I kind of never looked back. And that's where the human part really comes in. So I became a team lead, engineering manager, director of engineering, eventually VP of engineering, which gave me like quite a bit of perspective on things. And, and, um, and then eventually I kind of fell out of love with the technology aspect of it. Um, it was not what was driving me anymore. It was the human part that really was. And so with that in mind, I just thought to myself, well, how can I do this more of the time, 100% of the time, if possible? And that was becoming a coach um, and an advisor to, to startups, but primarily a leadership coach for individuals in tech. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'd love to start maybe a little bit with that journey as yeah. you navigated those increasing kind of scopes of responsibility, what were the things that you noticed changing as you went along? And what, if anything, stayed the same? Well, I think I would say the first thing is, is like the types of feedback that you get from whatever is around you um, is very different. So as a developer, it's very clear to you what impact you're having, what you're creating, what you're doing, what you're building even to the level of detail where you run your tests, is it green or red? It's either working or not working, right? Um, and, and then also from a work perspective, did we achieve the goals that we had? Did we actually create what we set out to create? So in that sense, the feedback is a very short and very clear feedback loop. When I became a leader, obviously those things were not there anymore. And so instead of dealing mostly with bits and bytes, then we started dealing with with people and emotions and we're all like these beautiful snowflakes, uh, myself included, right? And so then I had to, to kind of search for my own feedback loops to orient myself. Um, and that definitely gets a little bit trickier. I think the other thing that changes obviously is the scope and sort of the responsibilities that you have. And you're less focused on maybe a particular code base, a particular product. And, and then it becomes a lot more about how do I help this team win? How do I help this department win? How do I help this organization win? Um, and that leads to some very interesting challenges as well that become quite complex as, as you go along. So those two things definitely kept changing over time. And then lastly, I'll say that once you step into becoming a leadership coach, as is my case, then the feedback is even less obvious, right? I'm not sitting down with my clients on their day to day. I don't know how they run their one-on-ones specifically. I don't know what goes on in the meetings. I only get it kind of secondhand from them. And because of that, it's hard to really understand exactly what your impact uh, is and the value that you bring to the table. That being said, again, you need to find your own feedback loops. And sometimes there's direct recognition and say, okay, you really helped me with this and this is what happened. And we bring that back into the sessions. Um, but ultimately you also have to kind of let go of that and just focus on being the best coach that you can possibly be, keep educating yourself and just, you know, creating the most value that you can. So those things are the, you know, three things that come to mind that really changed over time for me. Yeah. I'd love to dig in a little bit more on the feedback front, because as you highlight, yeah. this is a, an extremely common 
challenge as you move into more indirect roles, more leadership roles. What tactics did you use or what systems do you set up to help yourself get feedback on, on what you were doing? You mean as an engineering manager or now as a coach specifically? Um, I, I would say let's let's lean towards roles within teams because um, I mm -hmm. think most of the folks yep. here are going to be working within a team. Um, so as a manager, as a director, as a VP, what types of systems did you set up for feedback for you? Well, I think a very important one is what we commonly call like pulse checks, right? Engagement service and that sort of thing, which... To be honest, I think these days get a bit of a bad rep and there's some survey fatigue, if you will, and I can totally understand where that comes from. I've seen that done well and I've seen that done poorly as with anything else. And what I learned is, and what I've seen working in my teams is you need to create an actual loop. So when we talk about feedback, do we have a feedback loop? Meaning do whatever we hear get, fed, get, get feed or fed back into the system, right? In other words, are we actually using this information, this signal, and feeding it back into the system to improve it? Are we changing as a result of having this conversation ongoing? And where I see it see, done poorly is just this idea that, okay, here's the whatever app we use for this, give us your feedback. And then it's like people feel like they're, you know, shooting their feedback into a black hole or something of that kind, which is very demotivating. As you, as you can imagine, right? And so I think it's the responsibility of leadership to establish that loop and to make sure that people understand how is that being used? What transformation, what change that is leading to? So one thing that I have to say, since we're talking about this, that I pride myself looking back in my career is that when I was a VP of engineering, I was able to establish this feedback loop to a point where we had 100% response rate to these surveys. And I was very proud of that because I really wanted everyone to be invested in improving things and feeling like they did have a say and an impact in how we shape the organization. And so that was very gratifying. So that's definitely one way that I think leaders can leverage much better um, than I think we're doing in general in the industry um, to improve their, their teams and their organizations. Yeah. Well, let's keep going. So yeah. what would you do to help people see what where their feedback is going how it's being used and create yeah. that that loop rather than the feedback black hole yeah yeah exactly so the first thing is to establish as usual you know make the implicit explicit and just set the right expectations we're doing this not just because it's something we're supposed to do or just checking some box you're we're doing this because we want to improve the way we work and this was something that was always very clear with every team that i joined Maybe I was not, I certainly was not perfect at it, but I had the intention of always having a continuously improving organization. So that means that we need to learn, hopefully every day, maybe every week, at least, we need to keep improving things. How do we improve? Well, the only way to improve a complex system is through feedback. And so I would try to connect these dots for people and create that awareness that we're doing this for a reason not just because it's fancy or it's what you're supposed to do, but because we need to collect this information so that we have a chance of saying, okay, what is most important here? What is the one thing that we can tweak or change or improve that gets us to a better place as an entire team or organization, right? So just setting those expectations, creating awareness and kind of creating a bit of inspiration around this, I think definitely helped create that activating energy, if you will, uh, that got the ball rolling. Then the question to your point is like, how do you keep the ball roll, rolling? And so I would, for example, leverage all hands meetings and something that I used to do that I call the top of mind email, where I would share regularly with the team on a weekly basis, you know, what were my priorities? What, were, what was I seeing, et cetera, et cetera. And I would leverage, especially the all hands meetings where I would have, you know, a couple of slides that would Collect, would um, collate, uh, I don't know if this is the right word, but basically would summarize what I was seeing on the back end of the tool that we were using and what insights we were getting for, from that, right? And then would, there would be a little bit of Q&A and people would express whatever, you know, questions or suggestions or insights that they would have. And they would see then, okay, what are the actions that we're taking from here? 
right? And then I would announce what those actions were. Obviously, they were articulated with my engineering leadership team, and we would try to collect as much feedback from other sources as well throughout the line. But ultimately, awareness, and then exposure, and then action, so that we see, okay, this is actually leading us somewhere. I love that. I want to follow something that you said there. So you talked about this is one example of making the implicit explicit. And that is a theme that I have seen show up all over the place. I'm curious where you, what other places you have encountered that as an important approach? Yeah. Well, again, bringing it back to leadership, um, I think what's really important is that leaders, first of all, understand themselves and who they are, what is important to me as a leader, what are my principles, what are my values? Because what I realize is that whether you have that explicit for yourself, whether you have that clear for yourself or not, it will get expressed in your actions. It will get expressed in, in the teams and organizations that you build. So might as well be clear about that because, well, there might be some things that need to be tweaked or there are some aspirational values that can also come into play. So it's important to make those explicit first and foremost to yourself. Get to know yourself and do whatever inner work you need to do. Um, for that to be possible. Then I would say the next stage is be upfront and clear about what those things are. I'll give you a couple of examples from my own leadership. I was very influenced by a phenomenal book called um, Turn the Ship Around by Captain David Marquet. It's a phenomenal book because not only it's a great story, but because it illustrates this approach, this whole mental model of leadership that he calls leader-leader or intent-based leadership rather than leader-follower. And that is something that I really took for myself. And that has a lot of implications, right? For example, the way I run a one-on-one -on -one is very different if I believe and fundamentally want to create a leader, 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 leader model, where it's much more about coaching and mentoring and, and really like a peer relationship rather than a status update or just talking about the projects or when is this going to be done. That incentive incentivizes like a follower relationship where you report to me and I'm your manager, right? And so that would be one, one way, right? What are your principles and be clear about them with the team? And then lastly, you better walk the talk, right? You better demonstrate that you're serious about this stuff. So just to give you one more example, I already we already talked about continuous improvement and learning. Well, if we're serious about that, then when we have an incident, writing an incident report and learning something from that is not negotiable. It's not something that we do if we have time, right? Something else that is not negotiable is going to fall off or has to fall off because that one is not. And of yeah. course, I don't have a list of like 30 or 40 principles that all of them are non-negotiable. We're talking about four or five that, that really illustrate or that really embody who, who I am and what I'm trying to bring to this team. And lastly, what I'll say there is that, of course, this is not going to be for everybody. So that also there, there's something to say about who's fit to work in a team where I'm the leader, right? It's not about doing what I want or what I feel is you know right or whatever, but it's like, here's a way of looking at this. Here's a way to kind of be as a team and show up as a team. Is this something that fits your own values and your own principles? If it is, very likely we're going to have a great time here. If it's not, that's okay. We don't have to all have the same way of looking at things and the same perspective on how the world works. There's plenty of other places and plenty of other teams that you can do a phenomenal job at. So that, those would be ways of making the implicit explicit, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Do you... so? So many different pieces that we can put oh, yeah. there. So I love the leader-leader oh, yeah. leader model. This is something yeah. that I very much embrace. And you highlighted some of the ways in which that might show up. If you're coming from that perspective, you won't be asking for status updates in a one-on-one. -on -one. You'll be focusing yeah. on other things. Where else does a leader-leader approach show up in your work? Well, you know, for example, one thing that I always took pride in is to build was to build a great engineering leader, leadership team, like my staff, so to speak. And I don't think you can do that uh, if you have a leader follower mentality. I mean, you can build a leadership team for sure. Is it going to be the best possible leadership team where you have all the creative juices and all the creative energy and the intellect and the heart of different people coming together? 
right? And, and being something that is bigger than the sum of the parts, I will assert that only with uh, a leader leader sort of approach will you be able to tap into that. So that would be one way, uh, for example. I think the other way it really touches on, or the other, let's say, example of this touches on something that tends to be a, a bit of a sore point. And I see that a lot with my coaching clients and the organizations that, that they're in, which is the relationship between product, design, engineering, the business, etc. Like, how does this all work together? I do believe that when you have like this leader-leader mentality, it's sort of, I don't like the word empower because it feels like I'm giving you the power that, you know, you didn't have already. But it's like, people really feel emancipated, if you will, to take their own, to act and show up like a leader in every situation. So rather than ask for permission or whatever, it's like, okay, let's all think like leaders. And that includes like the organizational aspect of it. And so how are we going to show up in a conversation with product, with design, with a business counterpart? It's going to be different than if we have the mentality that, you know, we're following and then to make matters worse, engineering is kind of like downstream from everything, you know? And so everybody feels the weight. No, let's level the playing field. That's what I always used to tell my teams. We don't, let's not give away our power, not to wield it as being adversarial, but because we want to be truly collaborative rather than a service relationship in, in the worst possible sense of the word, right? So I think all of those things stem from a mindset and a practice of leader leader and peer relationships, regardless of the org chart and the organizational structure and everything like that. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to pull back to another thing that you said and kind of dive down that. So you yep. mentioned that the only way to improve a complex system is through feedback. And there's a lot that is <laughs> implied in yeah. that statement. So I'd like right. to, to start diving there and make the implicit explicit a little bit. So what do you mean when you yeah. say a complex system and how do you think about that? Well, I think one thing that really helps wrap our minds around this is something that is called the Kinevin framework that was created by Dave Snowden a while back. And basically Snowden is telling us that there are certain situations or problems in the world that are simple. Some of them are complicated. Some of them are complex and some are just downright chaotic. And this distinction really matters because the way you tackle a simple versus a complicated versus a complex or a chaotic problem really is different. And I'll give a couple of examples. And so when a problem is very simple, you know, like, I don't know, something, you know, at your house where it's completely predictable how to, you know, put up a fixture or something like that, there's a best practice for that. And usually it's not that hard. When you have a complicated system, in that case, there are some good practices, usually requiring expertise, right? So for example, putting a budget together is something that I probably wouldn't do a very good job at, but you know, a good CFO or a good accountant, they will know the tips and tricks and the techniques and so on, and the good practices to put something like that together. But there's multiple ways of doing it competently. When it comes to a complex system, then we have a different situation altogether because there's no necessarily good practice. Why? Because cause and effect cannot be predicted in a complex system. You can only see it after the fact, which means you need to run an experiment or multiple experiments to see what happens out there, right? And this is where the feedback comes in. And this is where something called safe to fail experiments come in, right? So for example, to, to put this in more tangible terms, let's say a retrospective of an agile team right? A team of people is always going to be a complex system because the, it's the interaction between the parts, in this case parts, because they are actually people. It's the relationships and the way the information flows and how we work together that is going to dictate the results and the outcomes that emerge from those relationships. But you cannot predict them beforehand, just the same way that you cannot predict how traffic is going to flow, right? But we do things when we create certain constraints and we experiment with certain things. I'll give you a quick example. Here in the city that I live in, Berlin, Germany, there's this huge street, one of the best known shopping streets in Berlin, that was closed off to traffic for two years or something like that. 
And I learned recently that there was actually an experiment to see how traffic would flow elsewhere in the city as a consequence of that, of that uh, street being just for walking only, right? That's an example where we cannot predict because mm-hmm. how can we predict the behavior of people, right? But what we can do is that we can run that experiment and then we can look back and see what did we learn from this? Does it make sense to continue or not, right? And so this is a very long way of saying that when you try to solve a complicated, sorry, a complex problem as if it was complicated, you run into problems, right? Because the system, the complex system is not amenable to control and to prediction and so on and so forth. And I can go deeper into this, but I, but I hope it already like gave you a, some, yeah. some sort of an answer to your question. Yeah. So one thing that is kind of interesting here is while you're totally right, you cannot completely predict it. There are patterns mm-hmm. that emerge and mm-hmm. we end up with things like agile practices that are not a recipe in the, you could have a recipe for a complicated system and it will always work the same. And an agile yeah. team, every team is going to be different. However, this pattern or set of patterns tends to nudge those systems into better behavior frequently. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if you have a kind of internal library of sort of the features of systems that you show up in teams and organizations and patterns that you apply for them. Yeah, well, one pattern that immediately comes to mind, and I, I wrote in my newsletter recently about this this individual, um, Deming, Dr. Deming, who is known for what's called statistical process control, which is a bit of a mouthful. And that was basically how he helped the United States win the, the Second World War, because the United States just completely outmanufactured in quantity and quality everybody else. Um, but also helped rebuild Japan after after the war with the exact same method. And a big part of that is what's called the PDSA cycle. So plan, do, study, act. And this concept is very simple. Plan something, do it, then study what happens, and then act on that, as in, is that part of your process from now on or not, right? And so you have this continuous improvement loop that is familiar to anyone that that is into you know kaizen and those sorts of approaches from the japanese and toyota being like maybe the the most well known example of that and, and the primary one primary one um but ultimately that pdsa that's essentially what you have with a retrospective for example an agile retrospective and so this is where i sometimes get a little bit upset maybe that's that's the right word when i see teams that You do retrospectives, but what they ultimately are doing is a box checking exercise because they're sort of blindly following some sort of a framework. I don't know, it might be the start, stop, continue, might be the four L's, might be whatever other esoteric framework there is, but they are losing sight of the fact that the whole purpose of this is to iterate on the team itself and on its process of work and then end up getting to the end of the retrospective, either with nothing to show for other than a good feeling maybe, or with a long list of action points, because we're trying to please everybody and contemplate everybody's ideas. And then none of this actually gets tackled and we perpetuate the cycle from that point on, right? So back to your question, what is the pattern? Well, the pattern should be to have that continuous improvement loop and to use an engineering analogy that is familiar to both of us, I like to use semantic versionings, like your team is versioned, right? (laughs) <laughs> and let's say uh-huh. your team is like 1.5.6 right now, whatever that means. We don't want to go to version two in one shot, but we also don't want to stay stuck in 1.5.6. What is the 0.7 that mm. gets us to a better place through mm-hmm. the process of continuous improvement and leveraging retrospectives? I think that's a good mental model to think and, and to kind of like go back to your question about what's the pattern that would be one pattern of continuous improvement that I would be looking at, which again, respects the complexity of the system because we're not saying this is going to work. We're saying this is our best shot as far as we can tell with the information that we have. And then we're gonna see what happens and two weeks later, we're gonna reflect on that as a team. Yeah, I love that. Well, and it's fascinating to me, this particular pattern has emerged in some ways, I think independently in so many different places. Um, so yeah. as you were describing the loop, it was reminding me of another 
uh, tradition, which is the observe, orient, decide, and act, you know, yep. the UDA loop, which yes, came out the of Uda fighter loop. pilots. John and, Boyd, yeah. Yep, exactly. But describes an extremely similar process of let's look at what the situation is. Let's decide on something we're going to try. Let's try it, see what comes out, and then let's use that to act on our new knowledge. Um, that feels like absolutely an emergent pattern of these complex systems. Yeah. And what's underlying all of this, Kevin, by the way, is that it's all about learning, right? At the end of the day, if you outlearn your competition, if we're talking about business in the marketplace, the one who's going to come out ahead is the one that outlearns everybody else. I was just writing the other day and I was digging up some data on like, what is really the percentage of startups that fail? And apparently that number that is banded around like 90% of startups fail seems to actually have some, some basis of re in reality. And then what I realized when I started digging into like, what are the different reasons for startups to fail? Oh, the market was not there or, you know, the company internally didn't work well. Or, there's a number of founders that co-founders that get into difficult relationships. At the end of the day, you can always boil that down, all of those as a failure of learning. Because for example, I don't think Facebook started in the way it is today or Meta as it's called these days, right? Google was not what it is today. Netflix was not what it is today. So all of those companies pivoted because they were able to react to the change, to the ever changing conditions of what's ultimately a complex system, right? And they respected their own complexity. So just as a quick aside, people talk a lot about, and this is another one of my pet peeves, if you will, people talk a lot about tribes and squads and like that whole thing of, of Spotify, right? That came out at some point as the Spotify engineering culture. What people didn't copy necessarily, or let me put it another way, what they copied was the result of their thinking. And then there's a lot of copy pasting of that into organization. Oh, we should also have cross-functional teams that are like tribes and squads. We'll call them something different, another label, but it's going to be the same thing. What you're not copying though, or what you're not really thinking about is what are the principles that were behind those choices, right? That led to that. And so a lot of people say, ah, oh, even Spotify doesn't use that anymore. And it's true. They don't use that snapshot that they publicized and marketed really well. They, they iterated don't use version two point anymore, exactly. which was their marketing. Exactly, they're now exactly. on yeah. exactly because the core principles were there, and I suspect from talking to some people there that the core principles were being complexity conscious, being very people positive, like believing that everybody has something to bring to the table, and the systems thinking that allowed them to run a lot of experiments and keep iterating towards something that works, right? So very, very fascinating topic as, as, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. All right. So we've talked about one of these kind of emergent system principles, mm -hmm. needing this kind of continuous improvement core learning group and a uh, learning loop and a focus on learning. Are there others that come to mind for you that you've picked up as you've moved through this? You mean other feedback loops at the organizational level? Well, I guess there's two different ways we can go down. So we can okay. look at the different layers of feedback loops. And that is one that's fascinating, right? There's, there's many different loops with different time horizons and different scales. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing we can go. The other question is, are there other core principles of complex systems that you have uncovered that would be useful to talk about? Well, one thing I would point out, and maybe this is coming back to the idea of mistreating complex systems as complicated and the attendant consequences of that is that when you make that mistake and there's that confusion, and I think there's a big one that happens in most companies just by virtue of the way companies work and how they're organized, that ends up creating a lot of lack of success to begin with business-wise, but then in the process of that outcome, a lot of burnout and disengagement and people being unhappy and so on. So maybe it's worth us exploring a little bit what that what I call the great disconnect, maybe in a grandi too grandiose way, but what I mean by that, right? And it's intimately connected to these aspects of complexity. So long story short, the idea, and I realized that because when I was a VP of engineering, that's when I got the opportunity to be you know, in a leadership team and reporting to a CEO that was not technical and being exposed to board meetings and meeting investors and understanding that 
quote unquote, the game that was being played there was not necessarily the same game that was being played then in the teams that are building the product on the day to day. Right. And so that's where the disconnect lies. And what I realized is that, you know, at that level, everyone is typically in venture capital backed companies looking to the next milestone, right? How do we grow from here? How do we grow? What's the next milestone? How do we unlock the next funding round, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe that died down a little bit these days by virtue of the consequences. Maybe not, <laughs> but definitely the game. I feel like the the pressures that lead to that game are yeah. still just as present. Exactly, exactly. And I would agree 100% with you. But let's examine what are the consequences of that game, because at that level of executives and leadership teams and boards and investors, what we're seeking, because we're constantly looking at the future and sort of codifying what that future must look like in the form of a budget that has forecasts, that, that has all sorts of predictions, well, we need predictability. We want certainty. We want to make sure that we drive towards a certain outcome, right? The problem is, what do you have, let's say as a CEO, what do you have to bring this reality about to make it real? Again, like we were, you and I were talking about, we have a complex system made up of those humans that are unique and snowflakes and have ambitions and worries and fears and anxieties and, you know, all sorts of things. So here's the conundrum, right? The, the great disconnect that I was talking about. You are seeking predictability and certainty through a complex system, which is not amenable to control, is not predictable where behavior emerges and so on and so forth, right? And so when we think about it and we look at OKRs that pretty much everyone in a company is exposed to in some way, what we don't see is how those OKRs eventually ladder up to the company's OKRs and then they connect with the budget that then connects with some promises and things that must happen. And so a lot of that pressure gets downloaded throughout the, the organization, right? And it tends to be about, we need to meet this target. We need to do this. We need to do that. We need to reach this and that. And ultimately creates a lot of silos because everyone is really trying to move their metric when the reality is that there's a ton of dependencies. And one thing we know is that often we cannot optimize both the local. So for example, a team and the global, which is the company. So there's an inherent tension that kind of comes because of this disconnect, essentially, or at least partially explained by it, that creates a lot of problems on the day-to-day -day and a lot of changes in direction and a lot of bureaucracy that tries to, you know, kind of keep things in place just enough when the reality is that it's very unpredictable, behavior emerges, and we're back to all the tools that we were talking about, experiment, learn, experiment, learn, continuous improvement, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's one example. Yeah. So how do you bridge that disconnect? That's a million dollar question, right? And that, that would lead us into a very deep rabbit hole um, because there's kind of like two approaches that I can think of. One is very transformational, if you want to call it that, which is, well, we need a completely different mental model and a completely different way of looking at this. If we observe the language that we typically use inside of companies and specifically tech companies, it's all machine language, right? inputs and outputs and levers and, you know, uh, I don't know, optimize and maybe, you know, some, right. As I, well. I have a particular one that I'm on a campaign to break down, okay. which is, uh, anytime people talk about people as resources, I, I say, if you're going to call our people resources, we're going to call you overhead. <laughs> right. I love like that <laughs> people. And, and, and it comes to exactly this mental model of machine. Yeah. And it, it yes. has this concept of people as being, and it seems slight, but it, when you talk about, for example, engineering resources, it creates this concept that these are fungible things, pe exactly. things where you can swap this for that, and it will have the same output. And humans are not fungible. Everyone has distinct skills and abilities and the, glorious puzzle of being a manager is <laughs> figuring it. out how to bring those things together to achieve some outcome. But exactly. if, if we talk about, oh, we need some engineering resources for this. I'm like, no, you don't. You need a person or two. Which people yeah. are going to be a good suit for what you need? Exactly. Exactly. And I'm so glad you bring this up because it also you know, leads us to point to the reality that language is not merely descriptive. Language is creative. So we create our own reality with the words that we use. And if we use this machine-like language, 
and we have which ultimately betrays this idea that the company is a machine to be optimized towards whatever maximization goal that we have, then we should not be surprised if a lot of people feel like they're cogs in the machine because that's the mental model that we have, right? And to your point, if we call them resources, for sure, that's very close to the machine metaphor, right? So maybe what we need is to change the metaphor entirely. And instead of thinking in terms of the machine to be optimized, we need to think about maybe what we have is a complex human system, a living system that needs to be nurtured. And like with any complex system, how do we create the conditions that brings us closer to the objectives that we have, right? Don't get me wrong. I like money just as much as the next person. And I believe in, in profits as much as the next uh, you know, entrepreneur. And I do believe also, by the way, that's a different topic, but I do believe that private enterprise has a huge impact in the world that we live in, for better or worse. So might as well create companies that are much more respectful of what people bring to the table and can actually create unbelievable businesses that are so far inaccessible because we're treating this system as if it's merely a complicated system made of parts that, to your point, are fungible, right? So this is something that you probably can see I'm very passionate about. And I work a lot towards creating awareness through my writing and even to some extent through my coaching. Um, so people understand this is the system that you're in. So coming back to your question, we can completely overthrow the system and create a new one, which is not, I would posit that it's not very easy or very accessible, right? In that sense, I have a lot more faith in new founders that I'm seeing coming up that have a different uh, sort of perspective that are on the other side of COVID and all of the self-reflection that that kind of imposed on us, rightfully so. And I do believe that there's more companies being built with a different mentality. And one example where I, I think we can look at it sort of a KPI, if you want to put it that way, going forward, is that I just learned recently from this Brian Chesky from Airbnb, this interview that has been making the rounds, that it's the only company in the Fortune 500 that was founded by designers and still led by a designer, right? Why is this relevant for me? Because design thinking we know that is fundamentally human-centered. Yeah. And so I don't have anything against founders who came from the business school, like it's all humans and we're all trying to do the best that we can, but what is the right tool for the job? Is it the machine to be optimized or is it like this human system that needs to put the human first, the employee, the customer, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So I do think we have a long way to go. I call it a paradigm shift that is still to happen. I don't know if it's going to happen in my lifetime. I'm doing what I can to, to, to help it, but we will see what happens. Yeah. Well, to your point, fully overthrowing an existing system feels yeah. very high barrier. Absolutely. What can we do within the existing, existing yeah. system yeah. to incrementally as we highlight, you know, all of these systems need to move incrementally. So how do we incrementally move a system? What types of practices can we put in place to become more and more organic, more and more behaving in a way where we have a human first system that we are nurturing rather than optimizing? Yeah. Well, that's a really, really interesting question because I, I'm a believer that the environment has an outsized impact in the behavior of the individuals, right? So what I mean by this in this context is that if the system and the design of the system and the metaphor that we were talking about remains the same, then at the very least, there is an uphill battle in behaving in a different way. But I don't think all hope is lost, not at all, because, and this is one of the main reasons why I became a leadership coach, because I think the answer is in leadership, meaning being acutely aware of the environment and the systems that we exist in and still retaining the power and the ability to act in ways that are not self-serving, that are actually, again, human-centered, as we were talking about, and that sort of run counter to everything that the system is telling us. But I speak from experience. I do believe it's possible to have relationships between people that exalt a different, that bring a different mindset to the picture, right? And we talked about leader, leader. That is not necessarily, in fact, turn the ship around the book. We're talking about a nuclear submarine in the United States Navy. 
there's no more hierarchical, um, you know, command and control um, structure that I can think of. But like we learned from that book and also the book Team of Teams by General Stanley McChrystal, which is a phenomenal book about complexity, by the way, and how the military had to adapt to the complex environments that will exist in, right? That shows us that even with certain organizational structures, we can show up in a different way. And what that requires is self-awareness, situational awareness, and also an intent to do the right thing regardless. Yeah, and I'm kind of getting into woo-woo territory a little bit here. But again, we talked about it before, values, principles. What do you bring to the table? What do you stand for? Is this just a job or is this something where you're actually contributing to something bigger than yourself and you want to bring others along in that journey? I can't make that decision for other people, nor do I want to. I just make it for me and I try to do the best that I can to be, you know, uh, consequent with that. Yeah. Woo-woo territory is, a, is an interesting <laughs> direction to go because I think it's something many of us as engineers feel allergic to. And yet there are aspects of it that tie to real things. I think one of the interesting examples that you highlight there is, you know, it can feel very woo-woo to talk a lot about values mm -hmm. and my values. And yet we've seen mm -hmm. that getting explicit about what we care about and communicating that helps our teams act on those things, make them happen kind of, uh, and get decide also if this is not the right environment for them. Yeah. Are there other places that you run into where something that, that may sometimes be considered kind of out there, kind of woo woo, um, actually have a foundation that when you run into it, the, the outcomes and the tactics end up being rather concrete. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing that comes to mind immediately is how do you show up in the world in terms, or how do you believe the world works in a sort of almost spiritual way? And by spiritual, I want to be clear, I'm just defining it as in non-material, right? So it's, it's simply not something that we can see and touch, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, right? So for example, the empathy that I have here with you and the conversations that we have had, that's not tangible. Nobody can see it, right? But to me, it's just as real because it signifies a connection. And I'm here having this conversation with you about something that matters to me. And I'm here with, with a lot of pleasure, right? So that to me is the all-encompassing sort of spiritual. And I'm definitely getting into woo-woo territory here, right? Um, so how do you see things working? Do you believe in karma, for example? Do you believe that you know, the collective above, above the individual is something to strive for, right? Do you give without the intent to get back and you know that the universe works in mysterious ways. Well, again, it's for everyone to make that choice. I do believe that there's something at work <laughs> um, in the way things work, if that makes sense. And I try to show up in that way. And it has served me really well, not because when I say serves me, not because I'm trying to extract from the system, but because I'm deriving a ton of satisfaction in here and there, creating some value for some people that benefit from it. And so when we get back into organizations, I think it's exactly the same thing, right? When we put the team over the individual, I do think that good things happen. And that's much more conducive, again, to building great businesses where people are, to use the words of Gary V, which is someone I look up to, where people are hugging each other in the corridors because they really, you know, enjoy working together and they're building something meaningful that is bigger than themselves. I do think that even this building something that is bigger than yourself or to a mission that is bigger than yourself can be considered woo-woo territory, right? And I do think that we're all wired, as I, well, I would say Maslow uh, and the, his pyramid of needs kind of shows us that we're all wired to crave that, to, to, to want to transcend who we are and create some sort of a legacy, right? So I think that's just as true for an engineer as it is for an engineering leader, as it is for a founder, particularly where, where that tends to be more prominent or more explicit, right? So I think those are things that truly manifest in the workplace that I don't think we should negate, that we should embrace instead. And frankly, they just make work a lot more fun than the typical dread that some places end up creating. Yeah. Well, and to, to take a couple of your examples, I think they, yeah. we can talk about them at a woo-woo level, mm 
-hmm. And for many people, that's fine. But we can also break down, in some cases, down to a very tactical level how they help. So using the example of um, karma, you give and mm -hmm. you get. We mm -hmm. as human beings have at least somewhat baked into our genetics a concept of reciprocity. It is something exactly. that most, not all, but most human beings have from a very early age. I give and I get. Someone yeah. gave something to me, I have an obligation to them. And so whether or not you believe in some cosmic sense of karma, if you are doing good things for other people, they will feel a, a desire to do things back to you. And so what you give will come back to you, even purely mechanistically through the actions of the people around you. Yes. And I think a lot of the different pieces that we sometimes talk about as this like kind of fuzzy thing end up having some reality to them down in the mechanisms of how we as human beings interact. 100%. And I'm so glad you actually say this because, you know, maybe this is top of mind because I was just writing a piece that was kind of reacting to this whole McKinsey article and the developer productivity thing and, and oh, so gosh. on. So yeah, yeah, that yeah. that's that's an interesting one, actually. I mean, we could do an entire podcast on that topic, I suppose. Um, but but what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, ultimately there's a gap between uh, in a breakdown of trust between different constituents, let's say different types of people in organizations that is not helping anyone. So I do think that engineers have are complicit in this situation. And I speak as, a, as an engineer by trade and someone who's been in the industry quite a while. I also think that certainly business executives and, and leaders and managers are complicit in that. And so what I'm trying to say with this is that we tend to, and especially as you pointed out earlier in our conversations, engineers tend to be very left brain oriented, very rational, very analytic, which is what brought them success and what makes them incredibly valuable. However, when we start talking about these things where, okay, we need to work together and to work together, we need to kind of understand each other. And as Stephen Covey of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People talks, talked about, the fifth habit, I never forgot it when I read that beautiful book, which is seek first to understand, then to be understood, right? And this to me is in this realm of sort of emotions because the flip side of not trying to understand first and just trying to be understood is that you're going to create resistance. You're going to create defensiveness. You're going to create a threat space or a threat mode in the other person, which is the last thing you want if you actually want to convince them of something or bring some important change about. So I'm just tying this together, kind of like how the brain works, but also how do we show up in sort of communion with others? How do we collaborate? Because that's the most pragmatic thing that we can do for the success of the organization. I've seen tons of teams and companies that operate at a fraction, a tiny fraction of their true potential because the relationships between the individuals, between the teams, between the departments are inexistent essentially or are in a place where they're not productive at all. So that's another sort of angle into that conversation. Yeah. Really quickly on that, because relationships are something I care a ton about. Do mm. you have any practices you use to try to facilitate and build good relationships within a team? Yeah, I was just writing on LinkedIn recently about this. And it's just this idea that I took from um, CEO coach Matt Mochari, one of my biggest influences. And he talks about just, you know, feedback as natural as running water by just doing it all the time. So relationships are built on a foundation of trust. And trust, as Jeff Winner, former LinkedIn CEO, talked about, is like it's commitment Trust equals commitment over time. I think it was something like that that he said. Or trust, consistency, not commitment. Trust equals consistency over time. And trust is also built on this giving each other feedback, which is a tricky topic when it comes to feedback, constructive criticism, and radical candor, and all of those things between two people. And I think it's because we don't practice it enough, right? And so we don't develop the muscle, we don't develop the skill. And so what I learned from Matt Mochari, to come back to that, is just this idea that every meeting we have, we give each other feedback, five minutes at the end, feedback on how this conversation went, how can it be better, how's our relationship going, is there anything kind of you know, being annoying or something like that. 
what are we doing well as well so we can double down on that and just do that all the time. And I think that takes the sting out of feedback because it just becomes this thing that happens so often that it's not different anymore. It's not, it's no longer that thing that is like, oh my God, feedback is going to come, right? And I'll add to that, that the best way to give feedback is to ask for it first. We have a natural response to criticism and to candid feedback because from a brain and an evolutionary perspective, we're like, oh, we're going to get criticized. That means we're not kind of, you know, we're missing the mark and therefore we're going to be ostracized and therefore we're going to be alone and therefore we're going to die. That's, that's kind of like how it plays out in the brain, right? Unfortunately. So that's a glitch yep. in our, in our programming, but we can become aware of that and just say, well, the brain that we have evolved in a very different time where there were some really important dangers. And right now that's not the case. If a conversation doesn't go well, it's not the end of the line for me at all, right? And we can learn from that. Yeah. So it's like this idea of giving feedback to each other all the time that really makes it a habit. I love that. So do you do that in group meetings as well? Because I, I have a practice at the end of one-on-ones, right? Where I'm like, yeah. I have a little bit of feedback for you. If I do, it's just in our standing agenda. Do you have any feedback for me? Uh, yeah. Is that something you do in other types of meetings as well? I can say that I did that with group meetings um, back when I led teams. I did not do that. That was more on the one-on-one -on -one side. And I try as much as possible to do it now with the leadership coaching because I also want to continuously improve the coaching engagement for the duration of it so that I can create, you know, provide as much value as possible to my client. But on a group setting, I cannot claim to have experience on that. In theory, that's just as possible. It just becomes a little bit more onerous, if you will. But then again, is it a cost or is it an investment in having a better team and a better, a better system of work? I think it can completely work. It's just that you need to create shared context on why you're doing this with more people, perhaps across mm -hmm. more teams. And so it takes a little bit more from a leadership standpoint than just in a one-on-one -on -one with your, you know, your direct report or your manager. It's like, let's just start doing this. And this is how we improve. Got it. Well, I realized just now we're getting close to the end of our time, which blows my mind. I feel like yeah. we could keep talking for hours here. Time flies. Um, is there anything we haven't talked about that you want to make sure that we cover? Hmm, that's a good question. Well, I'll say this. Uh, we were almost stepping into that that part and we didn't in this conversation, but maybe I can allude to it as, a, as like a parting shot based on your question which is, again, back to mental models and how software development kind of works and what's the role of engineers and engineering leaders and executives and kind of bringing things more together. I think one thing that every engineer kind of, uh, you know, shivers at, if you will, is the idea of estimations and kind of delivery deadlines and all of that stuff. And to make a long story short, I think a lot of it is, and this comes back to Spotify and, and what they were doing there and the principles that they had, among other, other people, obviously. It's just this idea of moving from not obsessing about how busy people are and rather focusing your view on your, your perspective on the work. So how is the work flowing through your team, through your process, and how is value being created to your customer? right? You focus on that, not on how busy people are. Because the reality is when you focus on how busy people are and you optimize for that, easily what you fall into is that, oh, that developer doesn't have a task. Can't be, can't be idle. So here's another task. And you create enough work in progress that because of the dependencies this, that almost everything has, you start creating this enormous amount of context switching, which leads to this enormous amount of waiting time from the work perspective. And so no wonder that things take a lot longer. No wonder that you rarely deliver value to your customer because you're obsessing and focusing on how busy people are. And guess what? I don't have to tell you, your customers don't, don't pay for the occupation or the utilization of your developers. They pay you for value and solving their problems. So if we don't have that flow going, we're not learning fast enough and we're not delivering value fast enough. And so we're leaving money on the table, essentially from a business perspective. All right, that's it for this human skills interview. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking this video and subscribing to this channel.
You can also subscribe to the Human Skills newsletter, which there's a link to right down below to get notified of interviews like this as they come out. Take care, y'all. This is K-Ball signing out.